This morning, as I'm sure you all know from our opening text, we want to continue our series on Samson. Our first lesson two Sundays ago was mostly focused on not Samson, but rather his father, his name being Manoah. And we saw in that first lesson that even though Manoah was a righteous man, according to Scripture, Samson didn't follow in his father's footsteps. And last Sunday, we saw that Samson was a chosen by God vessel or deliverer meant to deliver God's people from their bondage, the Philistines. He was separated. He was a Nazarite. He was to live a holy life. He was to be a special, we could say, hero for his people. And although God provided him, Samson, with great strength, outer strength, when he chose to carry out God's will, Samson was inwardly weak. And he fell in his temptations more than once. We saw that he was defeated by his wandering eyes and his great pride. Satan managed to lead him astray by means of a pagan woman and a dead lion. And as long as Samson rejected his Nazarite calling or his calling to be a judge of God's people, God could do very little through him. And yet he was to judge Israel. That was his calling, to judge God's people. And his first and foremost assignment as a judge of Israel was to deliver his people from their bondage, was to bring his people out of the power of the Philistines. And what does he do? What is one of the first things that we read about his life? He marries into the Philistine people. He did the exact opposite thing that he was supposed to do. In today's message, we'll start uh, looking at how Samson actually judged his people how Samson actually started to do what God wanted him to do and uh, free his people from the power of the Philistines. More specifically, we'll look at four different instances where Samson attacked the Philistines in some way. One of those instances we read in our opening text. And as we look at these instances of these attacks, we want to also consider Samson's motives for doing what he did. And I've entitled this message, Samson Plays Judge. And at the end of this message, I'll tell you why. So let's examine these four different attacks. The first of these four attacks is connected to our message from last Sunday. Last Sunday, we saw how Samson lusted with his eyes after a Philistine woman. And where did he do that? Where did he find her? And Timna, where she lived, which was ruled by the Philistines and populated by the Philistines. And so he went to the territory of the enemy, and there while he was there, he lusted after one of theirs, a Philistine woman. And as much as his parents frowned upon this arrangement, eventually they agreed to it. And in verses 10 through to 14, we read about them preparing this wedding feast. This is what God's word says. So his father went down to the woman, and Samson gave a feast there, for the young men used to do so. And it happened when they saw him that they brought thirty companions to be with him. Then Samson said to them, Let me pose a riddle to you. If you can correctly solve and explain it to me within the seven days of the feast, then I will give you thirty linen garments and thirty changes of clothing. Sounds great. But if you cannot explain it to me, then you shall give me 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothing. And they said to him, pose your riddle that we may hear it. So he said to them, out of the eater came something to eat and out of the strong came something sweet. What was his inspiration for this riddle? The lion, yeah. The lion that he defeated with God's help and then later visited again because he was so proud about what he could do and saw that there was honey in this dead lion. And even though he knew that eating from that honey, taking that honey, would defile him in front of God, before God, he did it anyhow. And not only did he eat of it, but he also gave some of that honey to his parents and it defiled them as well. And he didn't care. And here we see how he boasts about what he had done by making a riddle based off of his sins. 
Now let's consider these garments for a moment, why they were so important. And I'll just read what one commentary says. It says, the Hebrew word for linen garments here is not the usual word for clothing, but appears only three times in the entire Bible. Here and in two other instances, in Proverbs chapter 31 and Isaiah chapter 3, it refers to fine linens worn and sold by women. So Samson's offering was extravagant given the value of such finery. So not only had Samson sinned in these various ways, like I already has said, after lusting uh, after the Philistine and disrespecting his parents and taking a godless woman as a wife and defiling himself with the carcass of the lion, but now he was making light of everything that he had done and all the ways that he had sinned. He was making light of his entire sinful state by trying to manipulate and cheat his wedding guests. And he didn't even think about what, what the consequences might be for having done this. And we're told in God's word that the men had a hard time figuring out this riddle. Why? Because it's something that he just made up. It didn't really make a whole lot of sense. It was from his personal life, his personal life experiences. And so these men became frustrated because giving 30 fine linens would have cost them a great deal of money. And they didn't want to lose out on this. They also wanted to win them from Samson. And so these 30 men, they, they went to Samson's wife and they said to her, entice your husband that he may explain the riddle to us or else we will burn you and your father's house with fire. And then they say to him, or to her, have you invited us in order to take what is ours? Is that not so? Were they wrong? They weren't wrong. This is exactly what Samson was trying to do. He was trying to cheat and rob his own wedding guests. I, I can't imagine ever being invited to a wedding and then at the wedding get robbed by the bride and groom. But that's what was going on here. And so they threatened her life and the life of her father. And, and she knew very well. She knew who her people were. She knew that they would do it. And so Samson's wife pleaded for Samson to tell her the answer to the riddle. And because she pressed him, is what God's word says, or constantly asked him to do this, Samson eventually told her the answer, which she then revealed to her people. And, and so they won the bet. And Samson's reckless behavior nearly cost him the life of his new bride and her father, his, his father-in-law. And, and he didn't care about that. He was angry that he lost the bet. He was angry that now he would have to pay up what he had promised, these 30 expensive garments. Did he have these garments? No. And so in his fit of rage, in his fit of rage, he goes to the Philistines. Verse 19. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, and he went down to Ashkelon and killed 30 of their men, took their apparel, and gave the changes of clothing to those who had explained the riddle. So his anger was aroused, and he went back up to his father's house. So the first time that Samson uses his God-given strength to attack the Philistines and start to deliver his people from the Philistines is in a fit of rage for having lost a bet. Does this sound like a holy deliverer of God's people? Was he acting the way that God wanted him to act? No. He was playing judge. Now the first time that he attacked the, the Philistines, instead of going back to his wife afterwards, he goes to his father's house. And we're not told why Samson decided to go back to his father's house after this attack, instead of going to his wife, perhaps he was afraid of what the Philistines would do to him and Timnah. But because he failed to return to his wife, Samson's wife was given to his companion who had been his best man at his wedding. Well, that sounds wonderful, right? He really found a good family to marry into. And after a while, he, he did eventually return to discover this truth for himself. And his reaction to this news is found in Judges chapter 15. So the next chapter, in verses 3 to 4, let it, uh, let's read those verses together. And Samson said to them, This time I shall be blameless regarding the Philistines if I harm them. Then Samson went and caught 300 foxes, and he took torches, and turned the foxes tail to tail, and put a torch between each pair of tails. And when he had set torches on fire, 
he let the foxes go into the standing grain of the Philistines and burned up both the shocks and the standing grain, as well as the vineyard and the olive groves. And Bible scholars note here that the 300 foxes were probably jackals. The two animals are similar, and the same Hebrew word is used for both of them. So when you read about jackals or foxes in the Old Testament, it's this, they, both of those words come from the same Hebrew word. And foxes are normally more solitary animals. They live on their own, whereas jackals uh, travel in packs, and so large numbers of them could be caught more readily. It makes more sense. And whether they were foxes or jackals, one thing is very clear, and that there would have been other and far better ways to have attacked the Philistines than to first catch 300 animals, tie torches around their tails, and then send them into the grain fields of his enemy. I, I find it a little bit funny what he does here. And uh, there's perhaps possible different reasons why he did this. Maybe he was you know, afraid that if he would have attacked the Philistines this time again so soon after the first attack, they would catch him or they would find out who had done so much damage. But I think the more accurate answer is because of his immaturity. Either physically, we're not told how old Samson was, at this time period, maybe he was still quite young, or maybe because of his spiritual immaturity. If we think about his plan, it seems like something that children would think of, right? It does. I, I, can, I can see my boys thinking of a plan like this. It's funny. It's uh, interesting. But it's certainly not the best plan. His whole calling, if you read about what, what Samson does here, his whole calling to be a Nazarite and a judge of his people just seemed to be a big game to him. He never seemed to care about seeking God's will first, nor did he consider the consequences that his immature actions would result in. He just, he just acted so spontaneously and, and recklessly. Now, the Philistines, fuming at what had occurred, asked around as to who caused the damage, and they managed to find out that it had been Samson who had done it because of his father-in-law who had given his daughter to someone else. So instead of um, punishing Samson, God's word tells us that the Philistines came up and burned her and her father with fire. So his wife, the one that he loved so much and then abandoned, they killed, and his father-in-law. And then this is what Scripture tells us in verses 7 and 8. Samson said to them, since you would do a thing like this, I will surely take revenge on you, and after I will cease. So he attacked them hip and thigh with a great slaughter. Then he went down and dwelt in the cleft of the rock of Edom. So from what scripture records, this is, we can assume, the largest attack that Samson had led up to that point, the largest casualty list that he had made up to that point against the Philistines. And finally, he was doing what God had called him to do, to free the Israelites from the Philistines. But what do we know about these attacks? Every time he attacked the Philistines, how did he do it? A little bit louder. And rage as a response. How else? Yeah, out of spite. Very good. How large was his army? The army of one. Could he not have done far more damage against the Philistines had he, had he you know, mustered an army together? But he, he thought, no, he could do this by himself. God had given him strength. It would be fine. And he did so little. From what Scripture rec records, this was a great victory for Samson, but it could have been much bigger. And let's look at his motives. It was already said that he did these things not out of love to God, not because he cared for his people and wanted to free his people, because of anger, because of rage, because of revenge. That's how, that's why he did these things. Loved ones, is revenge ever the right motive for doing something? Ever. No, it's never the right motive. Romans 12, 19 says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says our Lord. So God is the great judge. He knows the hearts of all men. He will repay 
each one according to their deeds. That's not our place. That's God's role. Now, is it possible to do seemingly good things out of revenge, anger, or jealousy? Have Christians ever done good things out of the wrong motives? A real Christian shouldn't, right? But I'm sure there's been lots of people who profess to be Christians that have. Good deeds can be done in order to instill jealousy in others, right? Or have pulpits ever been misused? Have pulpits ever been used to preach against people in particular? I'm sure they have. But God sees the hearts. He's, he knows why we do the things that we do. But when we, who call ourselves Christians, behave in, in ways like these, we reveal a level of spiritual immaturity, just like Samson. When we do this, we, we play church, or we play Christians. We, we act Christian-like, not because we love God above all or our neighbor as ourselves, but because of selfish motives, just like Samson. Samson was to judge God's people, but instead of, to, instead of being the judge of God's people, he played judge whenever it suited him. And if God's people aren't careful today, they can fall into the same trap. Are we serving the Lord, loved ones? Let's ask us, ourselves this question. Are we serving the Lord from the heart, or is our Christianity something that we put on when it suits us? Is it something that we like to play when we're benefited out of it or from it? If so, then we, then we behave just like Samson did. In our last example, we see once again how Samson preferred to play judge instead of being judge over his people. After his previous attack, the Philistines mobilized an army against the people of Judah. And then verses 10 to 12 state, And the men of Judah said, Why have you come up against us? So they answered, We have come up to arrest Samson to do to him as he has done to us. Then 3,000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Edom and said to Samson, Do you not know that the Philistines rule over us? What is this you have done to us? And he said to them, As they have done to me, so I have done to them. But they said to him, we have come down to arrest you that we may deliver you into the hand of the Philistines. Now, there are so many things that I find disturbing about these verses. God had sent his people a deliverer, probably, probably because they had prayed to God, cried out to God for him to do exactly that. They had done this so many times before already. God, please save us from those who oppress us. And God heard the prayers of his people. He chose a, a, a person to be the next judge over Israel. He even empowered him with great strength. Something he had never, ever done before, nor ever would do again. And so Samson was born. And he grew. But then he only used his strength to enrich himself, and to avenge himself. His recklessness causes his own people to despise him and want to betray him. Here was their deliverer. And God's people go to him in order so that they can deliver him to their enemies. Now, could you imagine how, how different this, this scenario would have been had, had Samson gathered the people together, mobilized them, and led them out into battle against the Philistines. I'm sure God would have given them the victory. But he didn't care. He played judge. And how, how does all of this apply to our lives today? Well, this is what one commentary writes. Samson impulsively used the special gift God gave him for special purposes. For selfish purposes, and I'm sorry. Today, God distributes abilities and skills through the church, 1 Corinthians 12. And the Apostle Paul states that these gifts are to be used 
to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ, Ephesians 4. To use these abilities for selfish purposes is to rob the church and fellow believers of strength. And then the writer asks, or says, as you use the gifts God has given you, be sure you are helping others, not just yourself. If we continue this account, we know that Samson agreed to be delivered into the hands of his enemies, the Philistines. And once in their midst, we know that God gave him the victory. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. He loosed himself of the ropes which tied him, and and he killed a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey. That was his plan. He would just be delivered to them, and the nearest thing to him he would take, and he would slaughter a thousand people. A foolish and reckless plan, and yet God gave him the victory. God handed his enemies over into his hands. And then instead of thanking God for this victory, he takes all the credit for himself. We read then afterwards that he became thirsty, so he cried out to the Lord and said, Have you given this great deliverance by the hand of your servant, and now I shall die of thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised? He used his God as a water boy, not as his leader and savior and defender. And I have to think here, God must have had just an incredible amount of patience in working with Samson. And then I had to look at myself. How many times have I not done something contrary to the will and the word of God, but God had patience with me? God still used that little that I offered him and did something great out of it. But I don't want to be like Samson. I don't think any of us want to be like Samson. God had patience with him, and he even answered his prayer. Verse 19, So God split the hollow place that is in Lehi, and water came out, and he drank, and his spirit returned, and he was refreshed. One of our pastors from our work wrote, The strange thing about Samson is that he always planned and acted alone. He never gathered a following like Jephthah, another judge of Israel. He never mobilized an army like Barak or like Gideon. He also never sought direction from God, or at least were never told that he did. Instead, he behaved contrary to the wisdom and direction of his parents. He behaved selfishly through forbidden methods and means even though he knew that the consequences of his actions were piling up. As a hero of Israel, he never controlled his actions or his desires. This was a great shortcoming of his. He lived such a reckless life even though he knew he was divinely called to be set apart, to be something special for God, to be God's deliverer for his people. And he just didn't care. He didn't care. And verse 20 says, Samson judged Israel 20 years. Did he judge, loved ones? Or did he play judge for 20 years? This morning we saw how Samson led four attacks against the Philistines. The first one, because he lost a bet. The second, because his deserted wife was given to someone else. The third, because of his anger and revenge or vengeance. And the fourth, because of the hatred of his own people who betrayed him. The only good thing about these accounts is that even though Samson made so many reckless and foolish decisions, God could still use his situation to start freeing his people from the Philistines. But just imagine what God could have done through Samson had he completely placed himself in the hands of the Almighty. Had he served the Lord with all of his heart and truly had a love for his people and the oppression that they were suffering under. And as easy as it is to condemn Samson, loved ones, if we're not careful, we as Christians today can fall in the same trap. Instead of taking our calling seriously about sharing the gospel and doing God's work here on earth, there are many people who are content 
was playing Christianity, playing church, doing things without even thinking about it, doing things for the wrong motives, using their God-given gifts and abilities only when they can benefit from it. Can God use such people to further his will? Yes, he can. But how much more could he do with his people if we would give ourselves entirely over to his will? If we would lay ourselves entirely in his hands, he would not only equip us and empower us with the strength that we need to remain victorious, as we heard last week, but we could do so many wonderful things for his kingdom. I'm no longer content being a Samson. I want to be a David. Little David who slew Goliath. Who had a heart like God's. Whom God could use in wonderful ways. Because he trusted in the Lord. Loved the Lord. And obeyed his word. Loved ones. May God help us to examine ourselves to see if we're being Samson's or if we're being David's. Amen.